I'm going to talk about the future of the automobile. So this is not the future. These are some of the automobile I owned in the past. So the top left was my first car. It was a Dauphine Gordini. It was a very sporty little car, 45 horsepower. The second one on the right is, uh, was my second car when I was in the States. I was very, very proud. It was the lousiest car I ever had. Uh, very ter a very terrible car. But as you can see, I'm really a car enthusiast, and I love cars. But I'll show you my new car. This is my new car, OK? I have lots of cars. I have the car I want, where I want. And this is going to be the main topic of my talk. So in order to go forward uh, to uh, the future of automobile, I have to tell you doesn't go. A little bit about my background. I'm an engineer, and uh, very early in my career as a researcher, I moved into robotics, designing robots for the handicapped on the left. Actually, I even designed a wheelchair for handicapped. It was the first automated vehicle for people which ever came uh, in, in uh, operation. That was at MIT in 79, using uh, uh, Eight-bit microcomputer with 16K of memory, and it worked. I worked also in uh, industry. You see on the right, uh, I did many trips uh, to Japan in the uh, 70s because I was the president of the French Robotics Industrial Industrial Robots Association. So I was really in this uh, in this uh, uh, robotics business. But I said, well. I worked a little bit on an automated vehicle for the army, and I said, well, I love cars, and I really want to be part of the future of cars. So I decided in 91 uh, to move into the field of designing the car of the future. So I went back to INRIA, which was my original uh, research institute, and I said, well, let's design the car of the future. And they say, oh, OK, uh, well, if you can find some funds for that, uh, fine. So I did um, try to find some funds. Say, OK, look, uh, there are some people thinking about the car of the future uh, in the past. Let's go for something more ambitious. We don't want just a car where you can play or watch movies. That's not really the real problem. We have to address the challenges of the automobile. And the challenges are enormous. And we have been talking about that for a long, long time. Accidents, that's with, with one million deaths on the roads every year. This is a huge challenge. Uh, green use of fossil energy, greenhouse gases, uh, dependency on oil from special countries where we might have some troubles. Then we have the problems of quality of life in, in the city, of health, pollution, cost, because transport using a car is very, very costly. Equity, not everyone has access to a car, especially uh, my uh, baby boom generation. Pretty soon, we will be asked to uh, maybe pass a test again to see if we are still able to drive. So what do I do when I'm not able to drive if I live in, uh, in a suburb? So all these problems are being addressed. Uh, for accidents, we have better and better car. Actually, now the cars of today, generation, they look almost like a tank, you know, with very, very small windows, big pillars everywhere. They look awful. Eh? Pretty soon, you know, they will look like a tank, you know, with slits. Uh, crash zone, you know, I, don't, I feel them, they are terrible compared to the old cars. Of course, the old cars were very, very dangerous. I don't drive them anymore, you know. Um, fossil energy, well, we are probably going to move towards uh, renewable energies uh, from... Uh, uh, plants uh, from uh, plankton, maybe, or maybe from solar energy and wind through perhaps hydrogen. I don't know. This is not my field, okay? But I think this is being addressed. Pollutions, quality of life, this is a little bit more difficult. But I think the most difficult problem we have to face is the problem of space, which is running out in the cities. Actually, we thought that Going to the suburbs, you know, moving the cities in the countryside was the solution to space. So everybody could have a big house with a garden. That was the dream. Except that in order to go to these nice little houses, well, I don't think they are so nice anyway, uh, but 
you can grow some trees and they are a little bit nicer. But in order to go to these places, or at least from these places to your uh, work or to your mall, uh, you need to take your car because actually these places have been designed around the car. So there is no other way than to take your car. You cannot have uh, public transport for these kind of cities. Okay? So you need your car, and with the car, since you have many of these places, you, need, you have the congestion. So we are running out of space because we use cars on a huge amount of space. You know, on a four-lane highways, you can maybe move uh, eight to 10,000 people per hour. On a much smaller space, a train can move 60,000 people per hour. So this is very inefficient use of space, and we are running out of space in our cities. Actually, now people are giving back the space to more efficient uh, transportation means, to public transportation and to pedestrians and cyclists, which move much more efficiently than with a car. So actually, there is even some people working on what is called the walkability index, which is not just the way of walking, can you walk to the different places, but also can you use your bike, can you use public transportation? This is the index, and this is an example in Vancouver. Uh, the greener the map is, the better it is to live there. And people, especially the younger generation, but also the older generation, they want to move in places where it's nice to live, to walk, to go to the, to the um, uh, cafe, uh, side street cafe, okay, and the boulangerie and, uh, and uh, the, the little uh, corner store and uh, the movie theater and so on. So we want to live in these places because it's more fun. It's not fun to live in these faraway suburbs. And people are, we can see, and this is, a, I think, a, a, an interesting research topic, see people moving back to the center of cities where it's more interesting. But the problem is, do we need a car there? Do we need a car? And where do we park it? This is an interesting parking lot, you see. Uh, in the middle, it's not people looking for a parking space. Actually, these are parked vehicles, illegally parked. So this is why the cars are a little bit, you know, uh, at some funny angles, because in order to get in and out, it's a bit difficult. So space. If everyone has a car, you cannot give that space to everyone in a dense city. There is no way. So how do we go about that? This is actually what we've been working on. On this principle, what should we do? Well, we should you provide the car only when and where it's needed. When and where. We should provide a car for people who need a car at some places and sometimes. But the other time, we should walk, we should bike, you should use public transportation. This drawing, we draw it in 91. This is a picture in 91, still valid for me. So this is, for me, the future of transportation in cities. And I think we are moving towards that. And uh, my job as a researcher and as a technology pusher is to develop the technology to go there. Okay. So this is what we did. And the first step we did actually was to develop the uh, car sharing scheme around electric cars. And we were able to uh, work with uh, Renault, with EDF, with Veolia, to design the first large scale car sharing system in the world using modern technologies. Electric cars, induction charging. You see this little uh, pod under the, the, the Renault is uh, an induction charger, we use smart card access, we use a digital communication to manage the fleet, so we put a lot of technology, but no automation. Actually, this technology now is being deployed in Paris. We have 4,000 of these Autolib electric vehicles available on a car sharing basis with one-way trips. Okay? You pick it up at one location, you can reserve on your mobile phone your parking space at the destination, and up you go. And it costs you like two or three euros for one trip. So it's very efficient. And this is one way of moving in a city when you cannot walk or bike or take the public transportation. Maybe when you come back from the movie theater at 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, it's raining. So this is convenient. 
The problem with these cars is when you abandon them somewhere, you have to move them to another place where they are needed. So we developed this technology, which is basically robotic technology. You, know, you use sensors, you use control technology, and see you have one driver, and you can move maybe five cars together. Okay? This is really technology. That was in 94. So in 1994, we developed the technology to move vehicle cars around. We developed also our own vehicle to show the industry, the car manufacturer, that they can be a little bit more innovative since we need these cars for inside the city for very small trips. So we designed a city car, very small car, but still you can put two adults and two children or lots of baggages inside. And these cars are fully automated and they communicate with each other to have better performance. In 97, we discovered that there were people working on this same concept. This is a company which put the first automated vehicle in operation on the road. It's called, um, it was called Frog, now it's called To Get There, and they put this automated van in a parking lot at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam in 97, December 97. This was a breakthrough because before that, people say, no way, it will never work. Okay. So now it's starting to work. It's starting. Actually, they designed even a much better vehicle, which is still in operation in a suburb of Rotterdam to go between a train station and office buildings, about two kilometers away. You have these available on demand, so you can use them when you arrive at a train station and you go to one of the several buildings over there, automatically. It's a kind of horizontal elevator. So with all these people, there were some other people also in Europe working on similar concept, including uh, University of Bristol uh, with the um, Ultra system. So we put together some, some uh, a big European project. And from 2000 until now, we are being funded for doing, carrying this kind of research. We also developed some more innovative vehicles, such as this one only a two-wheeler. We tried one wheel, but it was a bit difficult, but two wheels, it's, it's feasible. Actually, we developed this, this prototype, uh, which was uh, running pretty well. That was in 2002, okay? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, we saw that GM and uh, the Chinese were developing these vehicles, two-wheelers, okay? And they are automatic vehicles. You can drive them with a joystick or they can run on their own, especially when they are empty. And uh, last but not least of the, our project, CityMobile, we demonstrated that these vehicles can run in a very, very efficient way in the city as long as they don't run in the main traffic. We don't think we can run these vehicles perhaps ever in main traffic because we cannot really predict whatever uh, a driver can do. Um, I think I will skip or just maybe present some, some of these uh, images to show you that uh, these vehicles did run during three months in the city of La Rochelle, which is really at the forefront of uh, uh, innovative technology. They were the first one to implement uh, bike sharing. They have uh, very, very nice uh, buses on a dedicated uh, infrastructure. They have these uh, electric boats with solar panels. Uh, and they decided, well, they also had the, had the first operational car sharing scheme using electric cars in 1999. And they decided to test the cybercars. The cybercars are, are automated vehicles. And they were very happy with that. And now we are moving towards a second uh, phase of City Mobile, which just started, and we are uh, happy to be with the uh, University of Leeds on this project, City Mobile 2, where we have five companies, five cybercar manufacturers. On the other hand, we have 12, 12 or 13 cities in Europe ready to experiment, and then we are going to match the two. So we are going to select two manufacturers, five cities, and we are going to do big scale experiments in these cities. So this is the next step. This is coming. You see, this is really the next step. So I will skip that. So this is my view of the future. Actually, this is the present. You see, this is uh, uh, Paris. This is the, the, the boulevard exterior of, of Paris, where you can see that the space has been reallocated to public transportation. You can see a bike path. You can see also there is no parking. 
Okay, parking is, di is disappearing very quickly. Over the last 10 years in Paris, they have reduced the number of surface parking slots by 40%. And this is a policy, okay? So that people, well, we give back, they give back the, the space to more efficient transportation uh, uh, systems. And uh, they uh, force you a little bit to think about other modes, okay? Because the car, you, since you cannot park it, or you have to park it underground, and people don't like to go in underground parkings, and it's expensive, so people think about not owning a car and not using a car, so using other modes, and sometimes it's much more efficient, but people don't think about it. So this is my view of the long-term future, where we can have these automated vehicles, perhaps, on a dedicated infrastructure for high-speed travel between between suburbs, for example, or perhaps even between cities. We have cars which can move in platoons, and these can be private cars or public cars. We will still need the private car if you live far away in the countryside, because we cannot provide, you know, send you a car, even if it is automated, far away to your place to pick you up and do your shopping. So we will still need some private cars, which can be electric, which can be automated on some of the infrastructure and which will move in your countryside uh, in manual mode. So this is my view of the, the future. You see, these cars will be used uh, when and where they are needed, perhaps much less often than now. So we will have much less vehicle miles traveled for many reasons. But the main reason that we will have other modes available and also, mostly, because we will have um, a better city where we can walk and bike. This is, I think, the, the, the vision of, of the future. So, if you really want to have fun with your antique cars, then you will be able to go on the weekend to these uh, big meetings where you will uh, enjoy uh, congestion and uh, perhaps a little thrill of going around, you know, a little uh, loop. Uh, and it will be just like nowadays going horseback riding, okay? You might even have your own horse uh, today, eh? well, you can still have your own car if you are really a car enthusiast. Maybe I will have a, one of these cars, but I still think it's kind of dangerous. Uh, one of my best friends in America died in a, such a meeting, so I'm careful about, you know, going to this meeting where you uh, get lots of excitement in uh, uh, going around a track. So this is my view. I don't know if you will share it. I'm ready to talk with it, uh, talk about it with you uh, during the break. Thank you very much. Merci.